this is the moment. The Bachelorette is back. Yeah! And the power. I'm gonna fall in love. Is in Jen's hands. And I'm gonna do it my way. ABC Mondays. Everything about her is great. I feel so special. Jen's looking like a queen. My men are very, very hot. Someone call 911. <laughs> you are looking so fire. This is the beginning of a new era. The Bachelorette. All new Mondays, 8, 7 central on ABC and stream on Hulu. Hi, I'm Dr. Lori Watson and the co-host of Foreplay. I'm your co-host, George Fowler, former firefighter, your couple's therapist who loves to talk about sex. Woo, let's discuss everything about the best sexual techniques to building your emotional intimacy, which is really necessary for great sex. We bring sound, concrete tools to reframe your relationship problems and learn how to fall in love again and feel desire. Listen to Foreplay Radio on the iHeart app, on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, everybody. Welcome. And thank you for listening to this episode of Marriage Therapy Radio. My name is Zach Brittle. Today, I'm here with Sara Nasserzada. She is uh, a delight. She is a clinician and a researcher and uh, literally one of the most pleasant people I've ever talked to in my whole life. Um, She is warm and insightful and brilliant. It was a delight to chat with her about her new book, which is called Love by Design, which you'll hear all about her goal for that book and some of the principles that she uncovered based on her research and really her life's work. I am using her work in my practice more and more. I think you should check out her book for sure. Again, it's called Love by Design. The book came out this week, so go ahead and pick it up now. Um, Or you can go to lovebydesignbook.com. There you can learn more about the book itself. There's some resources that include uh, discussion questions. There's also a relationship assessment that you can find there that can help you learn more about your relationship. I can also help you with that assessment. If you want to shoot me an email, I'd be happy to facilitate that with you. For now, I just want you to check out Sarah Nasserzada and her work. I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I did. This is a very cool conversation. Stick around. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. You are Dr. Nasserzada. Did I get that right? That was perfect pronunciation considering all the consonants. Yeah, there's a lot. I saw a thing that you did on the YouTube um, about names. Like yeah. You have a lot. You have a theory about names. Can you tell me what that is real quick? Absolutely. So it was actually a TEDx talk. It was called, uh, Hello, My Name Is. That was the title right. of the whole conference. And I um, I was glad to be invited because I have a thing about names because my name is Sarah. How easy is that to pronounce, yeah. to know? So it's biblical in some, you know, yep. parts of the world. Sure. And uh, it's really short. It's simple. But even with that, I had my own experiences with it. So, for example, growing up in Iran, uh, my si- older sister was Hana, then it was me, Sara, and then my younger sister, Saba, right? And we have a brother okay. too. We love you. It's just about, you know, the rhyming names of the sister now. So, in case he's listening. <laughs> so, uh, I grew up with a sense of belonging around my name. So, I belong here. This is really nice. And the meaning of Sara, actually, Farsi, is pure. So, okay. and in our cultures, in collective cultures mostly, we believe that you become your name. So, names are very important. They're celebrated, there are ceremonies around them, you know, all that. So, fast forward, I'm in school in England. I stand up introducing myself. I said, Hello, I'm Sarah Nasser Zadeh. And immediately, without a beat missing, a person next to me said, Oh, well, you don't look like a Sarah. Uh-huh. And it really made me think for the first time ever in my life, why, who do I look like? Who is me? Who is you? Who is the other in this occasion, Uh, you know, that we're talking uh about? So I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And then I ended up doing a whole research around what people call themselves, what people call their genitals even, you know, because Uh that's the private part that, you know, Uh beside your name that you are given, other people get to choose your name when you're born. Also, other people get to choose uh, a name for your genitals because uh. it's not like, you know, we all might have really kinky little names for ourselves, but essentially we are told what we need to call ourselves or respond to and also genitals uh-huh. too. And how does it show up in our lives? How do we show up for it? So, for example, let's say a person's um, name is Pure. What does that mean to me? Up to uh-huh. this date, I'm keeping myself in check. Am I being genuine? Am I being dubious in certain situations? Am I being uh-huh. so? 
that becomes you, you become your name. So that's why I give that name. And also there's a lot of research these days around uh, how it would contribute uh, to include people or exclude people in certain circles. So for example, sorrow could be very familiar, very chic, or very mm-hmm. um, not very chic uh, in certain uh, cir- circles. And um, yeah. so it could be treated differently. And because of that, I could be perceived and received differently. And we have research yeah. Uh, to show uh, there, there was that Harvard, very famous Harvard research years ago that people with the minority names, especially African American names, got um, uh, half the callback numbers, right? Uh, half the callback rates uh, for job interviews and as stuff. other people. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so you know, there's a the whole thing around names. That I yeah. always start my workshops or anything that I do with names, everything huh. that I do. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I don't want to talk about it all the day long because I want to talk about all of the rest of your stuff, but I have two two follow-up questions. One is, what was the thing that you were talking about? I don't know if I quite wrap my head around it, but something that our brain does with our name, whereas when we're in sure. a crowded room and somebody says Sarah or Zach, our brain actually hears that louder or hears that better or hears that uniquely yes. versus any other word that's being spoken at that time? What, is, yeah. what am I talking about? It's called the cocktail party effect. Uh, yeah, cocktail so, party effect. Okay. Yeah. So so basically, if you are in a very crowded room, um, if somebody calls your name or something that is enunciated similar to your name. Uh-huh. Uh, like for me in classes, it was always exactly. The teacher would say exactly. And I would be like, wait, what's going on? Oh, Zach. <laughs> you know? Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Because the other thing is, if you look at babies, really, the first thing that they react to physically, like if you call their names, they turn. Mm. Right? Yeah. So that, that's that true. is that piece that, you know, it's very much ingrained in you. People in coma, they respond to huh. their names much better than any other thing that you bring up and, you know, talk to them about. So um, it's pretty much ingrained in us. And it's actually really interesting because that's the first piece of identity that we don't even choose. Somebody else can use. Mm-hmm. So there's a whole, whole lot to unpack there. Yeah. No, I'm into it. Um, my other question was, you, you're you Iranian. You grew up in Iran. Yeah. Yes. Iran? Yes. Yeah. How do you want me to say it? Iran. Iran. Yeah. What What should people know about what does it mean to be Iranian? Like- what, what does that mean? I'm glad that you're leading with that question because doing what I do, so I educate people about their sexual health, their relational health, the love that they're experienced. I went through a lot of interesting experiences because of that. When you say Iran, Iran is a country of almost 80 million people. Mm-hmm. We speak different languages. We, we have different mm-hmm. food, different regions, different climate, different... So it's a huge country. So it's really interesting. Up to this date, even when I say I'm from Iran and I haven't lived there for more than 20 years now, I went for my, all of my schoolings out of the country, you know, all of that. It's really interesting. It's still people ask me, uh, well, I have an Iranian friend. Do you know her? Like, well, actually, what are the chances <laughs> that I yeah. know them? Yeah. So it's yeah. a very um, common thing that people think about that, you know, when you're from a country or a city or a place, uh, then, you know, you're in the same bucket with everybody else from that part of the world. So what I would say, being an Iranian-American now, it's an identity that I'm proud of, but I think of it this way. I think that I grew up in Iran, so it was the root of my existence Hmm. with all the literature and science and um, culture that I carry. And, you know, that was the first language that I learned. So Mm -hmm. the whole- Farsi? Yes, Farsi. Mental conceptualization around, you know, existential questions in life formed for me in Farsi, right? And then little by little, as I grew older, my father always said, you need to strive to be the sun and it doesn't matter where you shine, you're shining Mm -hmm. the rest of the world. So- I really carried that with me. I never thought, okay, so I have to be clingy to my own culture or to my own. I always strive to be uh, global because um, I connect with the human essence rather than any parts of, you know, like uh, Mm. those certain build up uh, cultural um, identities. But then going back to that, so 
let's say being an Iranian is my root. My trunk was shaped in England because mm-hmm. I went to school and my first idea of differentiation from family and being a woman, how to experience democracy was that. Mm-hmm. And then when I came to the Amer- to America, we lived in um, New York for eight years and then up north in uh, Cupertino and Palo Alto. And then now in the Los Angeles, it's very interesting to me because I feel like then I kept growing branches and leaves and fruits. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's how I experience my identity when we talk mm-hmm. about Iranian or British or American. So that's how I view it. Mm-hmm. So you said we lived here. Who's we? When you when there's you, who is we? Uh, in New York, uh, I lived with my husband. So that's okay. that's what I, why I said we. Yes. Okay. And do you guys have children? Yes. <laughs> that's adorable. <laughs> You're like full face just lit up. You're like, I love my, you probably love them, huh? I'm trying oh to God. figure out how to love my, you know, I don't you, like them very much, but I love them. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on their age. Yeah. Um, mine are 17 and 21. So I'm, I'm kind of at the back end of active parenting, but I've, oh, I've said for a number of years now that I think parenting young adults is harder than parenting young kid, young kids. It's like total, it's, it's really pushing all my buttons. So um, it's never, it never, it's an adventure that never changes. Power to you. You can do this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. I'm trying. Um, okay. But we're here to talk about, it cause you have a new book that came out. It came out this, this week. It's come out like two days ago. How are you feeling? Fantastic. I feel like, honestly, I gave birth to another child, but this one took um, a lot longer. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, do, does, is it like that? Is it like, uh, you know, Tuesday came around and the book came out and you just, did you have a big letdown? Did you have a party? What did you do? Did you just wake I, up the next day and watch the internet and see what happened? Like, how did it, how did it go? Uh, you know, I what have does to one say, do on the day that their book comes out? I don't know about other people, but for me, I, this is my third book. So, but I didn't, the other ones were, um, uh, one of them I co-authored and uh, the other, well, actually two of them I co-authored, but they were more academic and also they they, they weren't as trained because, you know, like um, Johns Hopkins University Press, uh, you know, so it was more yeah. academically produced. But this yeah. one, I, I really wanted to insist uh, for it to have a global distribution because this is all my life in one book. And I'm not kidding yeah. when I say that. Okay. It's a very... It's everything, every tear that I, you know, cried with my clients and, mm. you know, of joy and sorrow with them. And every piece of your know, two big pieces of research that went to it. And uh, essentially, I would like to really change the world by rethinking the way that we talk, think, experience and express love. So it's a big deal. So when you say yeah. how it happened. I'm nervited, nervous, excited <laughs> because I'm okay. nervous because I feel like, okay, so how many people out there would be open to receive this? Because love yeah. is something that we cherish. We, it's almost sacred. So you don't yeah, talk about it as much. You don't analyze it. You just sensationalize it, right? How yeah. do you say it in yeah. English? Sensationalize it. <laughs> sensationalize. <laughs> yes. So... That, the book, by that, the way, is Love by Design. It's a gorgeous, great looking book. I love the cover, which is, thank you. you know, people put a lot of time and energy into their covers and it it's, looks great, but it's about six ingredients to build a lifetime of love. And you think, you think people might not embrace it. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't they, what, what would be the piece of, what would be the resistance to embracing an understanding of six ingredients to a, build a lifetime of love? Right. I have to first acknowledge our designing team at the publishers because they did okay. the cover. I didn't. So we, that was collaborative, okay. but it was mostly them. Um, and second, um, I'll give you an example. So the first okay. time I presented on our research was at the Stanford University. And then when I was done, a, a woman stood up, started sobbing, sobbing, mm. like sobbing and clapping at the same time. I was so moved by her. I said, can you please give her the microphone? What is happening? And then- <laughs> I want to hear more from that lady. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, I was so like, what are these tears? What are they telling us? And then she said, you just shattered everything I believed about love. And where have you been 20 years ago? Mm. 
So that tells you, you know, you're hearing something, everything that we were told about love is not what it is. So that is heavy. That's a lot of grief to deal with, right? right because Sarah. I, right? But then on the other side of it, it works. It's so almost common sense that this mm -hmm. is the way to go. And, and I felt, that, felt the pain of that lady because I was there. I was uh -huh. there 20 years ago. I didn't know. Okay. So what is it? What is love, Sarah? Good question. The way that I <laughs> describe it is when all of us grew up, probably we talked about something that I call submergent love, especially okay. in romantic situations. So two people, a man and a woman, get together, spend a lot of time together, and then um, they are drawn to each other, especially based on that sexual and physical chemistry that they have and they feel for one another. And then over a period of time, they become one. So one plus one equals one. I call that submergent love. You go deeper and deeper. And when you are in that state, then you are in love. Then what is the next uh -huh. step? Depending on your context, you might move in together. You might have babies together. You might have, you know, like buy something together, get married, you know, whatever that the next step is for you. The model that came out of our research and 20 years of my practice with couples was one plus one equals three. And I know yeah. that that language has been used before, but allow me to explain what, why it is different. I have a big, I wanted to say fetish, but it's not the right word here. <laughs> I have a big obsession <laughs> with uh, physics. You know, I would okay. skip school to study physics on my own at home. I love physics. It's so common sense for me, so sensible for me. So based okay. on that, I was very much drawn to systems thinking, the global, like, you know, that epistemology that shapes the whole world. Like, and then being lucky, um, we have a second cousin to my husband, who is Jabshit Arachadari, who wrote the book on systems thinking. He's one of the pioneering people in the world in systems thinking. So as I was reading his book to learn about the way that the world works, and uh, I came across this concept of emergent. I thought, hmm, that's really interesting. Sure. Can we apply that to love? Then I had extensive conversations with him, and then that became the base formulation for my thinking around emergent. Love as an emergent entity, not that it's there, right? So mm -hmm. it doesn't just okay. happen to you, you create it. It gets created, so, yeah. Then you the question- love. You literally make love. Exactly, exactly. You create love and then you don't just sustain it. You make sure it thrives over time. Uh, but how? I uh -huh. was interested to know how because I work uh -huh. with couples. They want to know how. They want to know what do we do tomorrow morning? Then that became my question. So I went into the research not asking what helps people or couples survive or what helps to sustain couple them or marriages? I flip the question and I ask, how can we make it thrive? Uh -huh. Who are the people? So not that what makes it fail, but what makes it succeed, thrive uh -huh. for both people or however people that are involved and as well as the relationship. So the analogy that Jamshid Karshidari uses is spark and log coming together in a conducive okay. context, making fire. I adopted that for love. Imagine, okay. and that's how we came up with the six ingredients. Okay. None of them could go away even for a day in a couple of them. So it's important. Okay. When people say non-negotiables, we can also use the trendy word, non-negotiable. Um, so basically one plus one equals three, and that third can only exist if these six ingredients are uh, in interaction with each other in a consistent and good quality manner for over a uh, lifetime. Okay, so let me see if I'm tracking with you. Please. In your metaphor, the one partner is a spark and the other partner is the log. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and the two of them can create fire if these other six ingredients come together in the in the right way at the right time. Uh, yes. 
And the fire is love itself. Yes, love, which is a byproduct of the relationship, right? So okay. that third entity that is the relationship also is the emergent love. Okay. And do I, I like what you said about people want to know, like, what to do tomorrow morning. I, in my practice, I call that Wednesday. <laughs> How do you do marriage on Wednesday? Not, you know, in your 20s or in your 30s. How do you do it like tomorrow? And you're suggesting that part of how you do it is you you invest in or you deepen your awareness or understanding or skills in these six areas. Yes. Hey, gang. I'm here to talk to you again about our sponsor, Rocket Money. I recently cut the cord, meaning we gave up cable. This has been a thing that we've been thinking about for a very long time. I just hadn't had the gumption to do it until February 1st. February is a new January. That's when I, that's when I did it. And in the process, I had to find out all of the subscriptions that we had. And Rocket Money came to the rescue. Um, I turned, it turns out I was subscribing to a handful of different kinds of entertainment providers. And, uh, and it helped me identify that there was one that was billing me twice and one that uh, recently had a price increase that I did not know about. And Rocket Money took care of all of that for me. I'd be happy to tell you what they found, but there's actually a brand on here that says you're not supposed to say their name, which means they're on to Rocket Money. Rocket Money and Rocket Money works uh, in two ways, right? It helped me cancel a st- double subscription that I'd forgotten about. And also it alerted me to a price increase that they then went in and negotiated back down for me. I wonder if I asked you how many subscriptions you had, would you be able to list them all and how much you're paying? If you'd asked me before I started using Rocket Money, I would have said yes, but I tell you what, I did not have any idea. Um, And it's just because I wasn't paying attention. I don't have time to pay attention, but Rocket Money does. Again, Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions. It monitors your spendings and it helps lower your bills. Rocket Money has over 5 million users, and it's helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash MTR. That's rocketmoney.com slash MTR. Rocketmoney.com slash MTR. Now, what are the six areas? Sure. So the six uh, ingredients, as I call them, and I'll explain why I call them ingredients. There's one Everything... that I have a very. Bi- there's one I have a question about that I'm excited to ask you. But go ahead and tell me what all six are. Okay, bring it on. I'm excited <laughs> to answer. So, in no particular order, is attraction, respect, trust, compassion, shared vision, acts of loving, okay. and they are all supposed to be reciprocal. And mutual. Okay. Do you have a favorite one that you like to talk about? Like, do you think there's one that that has to be like the you said in no particular order, but is is one critical? Or you've already said all six are critical, but is one of them stand out above the rest? Mm, depending on the phase of relationship, it might be, but no. Okay. All right. I I've seen I've seen similar lists before, and there are some usual suspects on there: trust, you know, shared vision. But I, it's pretty rare that you see attraction on the list, like that it's, it's kind of a no brainer, but is that required that you, that you and your partner are attracted to each other? Tell me more about that. Cause it sounds like, it sounds like a slippery slope, of course, as you age and maybe you don't look like you did when you were 20 or maybe you have other things that go on. Like, tell me about what you learned about attraction in your research. I love that because the way that you're describing it, you're uh, speaking about physical attraction, my friend. It's true. And that's the pitfall. Okay. That's the issue. So I love that you brought that up because, look, yes, we've heard before about trust. Yes, we heard about respect. This is no brainer. Everybody knows. Everybody agrees, right? But the way that our research defined them is going to actually help people to move from literacy to fluency. To give them the actual, let's say, for example, respect might mean something different to me than you, right? So in a partnership, you need to first define that, right? Know that you're like, for example, when I'm showing up like this, I'm actually showing up with respect and you're like, hang on a minute. No, that doesn't look like respect to me. Mm -hmm. But those Mm -hmm. are the elements that we need to help people move beyond the concept of respect. And how does it done? Like, how is it done, right? Now, let's go to attraction. First of all, attraction, especially in, um, actually in majority of the countries that I worked with, it worked within, which is like more than 40 countries now. It's um, this, as soon as you say attraction, you go immediately to physical attraction, 
which is sure. very important, very important uh, in a romantic partnership. However, uh, it's not the only one. It could be social attraction, intellectual attraction, financial attraction, familial attraction. Mm. It could be all sorts of attraction, right? So when we are narrowing it down to physical and even narrower than that, sexual attraction, then we are actually building the whole relationship based on something that is quite flimsy, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Like we go through mm -hmm. life, we might not even look at each other the same way. Uh, we might not even look at ourselves as the same sexual beings, right? Now, how do we remedy that? I think people are maybe you know interested to also mm -hmm. hear hear about yep. that because yeah. there's a lot of things out there like rekindling desire, reigniting something, something. And mm -hmm. honest to God, going back to chemistry that we learned on third grade, there's nothing to be reignited. You know, mm. I don't know when you did it in America, in Tehran, we did it on third grade. They brought the baking mm. soda and stuff, and then we made vol volcanoes. It said, you know, did the thing that it does, and yep. then it fizzled out. So there was no way to reignite it again, right? Mm. Or rechemicalize it again. The same thing with sexual chemistry. Now, let's differentiate sexual chemistry with physical attraction first, shall we? Okay. Physical chemistry is the type of attraction that you have for somebody who could be of any gender, like any sex, anything, depending on your sexual orientation, right? That you think to yourself that you're drawn to them sexually, right? Now, evolutionary speaking, you, you have that sexual chemistry to get attracted to a person who is diverse based on their genes to make cute babies with healthier genes because they're mm -hmm. more diverse with their genes, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, that is sexual attraction. That's amazing if you want to have hot sex, you want to uh, create uh, healthier babies for the most part, all that. But then moving on from that, some people would like to have experiences in life and that's great. But some people would like to build something with somebody, build a family, social capital, you know, different things right? Marriage with somebody. For them, sexual chemistry is not going to be the only thing that is going to work. So they're going to go look at physical attraction and other sorts of attractions that I listed, right? In, in the book and I said it earlier. Mm -hmm. But the physical attraction is mostly socially constructed. So sexual chemistry is yeah. not socially constructed, okay. evolutionary determined, right? But physical attraction is socially constructed. And that is the piece that came out of our research that was very important and one of the um, areas that you need to have in a relationship. So did I answer um, some of your... Yeah, no, that's fascinating. I, I want... The way I think about the podcast and the way I think about all my work anyway is that it should start conversations. It should be something that makes you go, well, I don't, I don't know if I fully get that or agree with that or understand it, but that means we got to talk about it more. So I, I want to talk about something that's not on your list that when I spoke to you last week, you said, and I was like, I'm definitely asking about that. Do you have any idea? Do you remember? Given the week that I had, no. <laughs> no, I just, I'm just wondering, like, because it, it blew my mind. Um, what's not on your list is empathy. And sure. you actually said too much empathy is bad for a relationship or em yes. empathy can be not good. And I was like, hold the phone. What do you mean empathy or too much empathy can be damaging to a relationship? Well, tell us about that. Thank you for that. So I want people to hold open hearts as we're going into this conversation and see if by the end of it, it makes sense to you. Okay. Empathy means feeling with another, meaning that literally yeah. you're going to Again, going back to the physics principles, you are going to ha create a neural resonance at the same frequency as the other person, right? Okay. That is possible. That will happen. Uh, it's a part of being in love with somebody, right? That you are going to feel with them, their pain. And, you know, sometimes even we have um, people, you know, we have in research that, you know, when a partner goes through giving birth, the other person feels the pain as strongly, right? So these are all telepathic empathies and, uh, you know, that 
in romantic partnerships or very close friendships or even familial connections happen. So there's a place for that, which is when you are trying to be in an intimate space with each other, if you are in a sensual space with each other, that works beautifully because you can read each other, you can dance with each other, you can really um, sync your nervous systems with one another, right? Or in a place of commiseration when, God forbid, as a couple, you experience something and then both of you are going through pain. That happens a lot around children, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. So you can actually see it and empathize with each other. However, on a daily basis, if we define empathy as feeling with another person, with your partner, and then compassion as feeling for the other person, I will vote for compassion for daily life of the couple. Why? Mm -hmm. Because imagine that we are a couple, right? And you come and say, Sarah, I had this... I'm so angry at my boss. This happened, that happened, that happened. Or even not that, you can even target it at me. You can say, well, I'm really angry at you. You did this, that, or I'm sad, or you know, whatever that you're feeling. Intense emotions, right? If I go right with you, then I will be feeling your emotions too. Then I will be angry and sad and you know, whatever that you're experiencing, right? Then who is there to re rescue? Right? So it actually right. will lose our perspective in that moment. Compassion gives right. you perspective because I can be there right. for you without making it about me. Right. And that's a big, big part of everyday interaction for couples. So you're not anti-empathy as much as you're pro-compassion. Mm, yes. I just think that everything has a place in a couple of them. And going back to the whole premise of this book, I want people to put their efforts where that matters. And I want them to okay. know that, for example, in this situation, when you come and say, I'm bleeding, it doesn't matter if I made you bleed or somebody else made you bleed. Mm -hmm. I need to be able to hold the space for you, be there for you, to think clearly, to get you band-aid if you need, to be there, to mm -hmm. hold space, to hold you, you know? But if I make it about mm -hmm. myself, oh, you're bleeding? Let me show you. I'm bleeding for you. And sometimes mm -hmm. it goes even further that you steal the other person's pain and they have no mm -hmm. space to talk about right. whatever that happened to them. So I'm pretty sure as a person who works with couples, you see that all the mm -hmm. time. Yeah, you yeah. Know? So that is the piece. And the book offers direction, insight, counsel into how to cultivate these things, yeah? Yes. There's one also that I'm keen on, um, the idea of shared purpose. I, I, t I say to couples all the time, couples therapy only works if the couple brings a shared agenda. Sometimes their shared agenda is deciding whether or not to stay married. You know, no. sometimes it's more sex, sometimes it's less conflict, sometimes it's more closeness, but it 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 always goes better when they have a shared sense of like what we're doing, what we're about, what we're in here for. And you have a model of of shared purpose that uh I guess I'd like to hear a little bit more about. It's the one with the diagrams, but in that model is both submergent and emergent love. And then there are others that people could find themselves attached to or leaning into for one reason or another. Does that, am I reflecting that correctly? Absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the ways that I work with couples is in our sessions and the first session, I make sure that all of us in the room, sometimes I meet with the couple and sometimes I meet with couples depending on their relational orientation. Sometimes there are more than one couple in the room, right? More, mm -hmm. more than two people in the room when we're talking about couple them, what I mean is people who are in a committed relationship with one mm -hmm. another okay. could be however many people, right? So one of the things that I learned over the years, um, and initially I would just draw it on paper. And then as I saw yeah. that it res people respond very well, then it, we included it in our research to validate the whole model. So based on that, was born the relationship panoramic inventory for couples. So when they take that, in that they are going to determine what is the current state of the relationship and where is it that they want to be. And then um, I get to compare to see whether both people or you know people involved, um, they pick the same model. They pick the same model. So that is really uh, important for us to know, especially as the person who is going to be the facilitator of that journey for them, right. right? Now, if I may, I would like to walk people through these eight categories that we validated 
through the sure. research. Sure, yeah, I'm all about it. Walk, it. walk us through the eight categories. Thank you. So the diagram, the first one is, if people who are listening, imagine two circles side by side, but not touching. So I call them friends with benefits. They're experiencing things together. Maybe they actually, uh, even their names are in each other's will. Mm. So they are going through life together. Maybe they're travel buddies. Maybe they are raising children with each other, maybe, but they are not in a relationship themselves. So friends with benefit, it could be anything really, uh-huh. or it could be living your individual lives and then once in a while meet each other in somewhere exotic, whatever that your definition is. This is mainly based on experiences, not building things. Contemporary couples are the ones that are, if you imagine two circles that are overlapping in the middle, but still they have a little bit left outside of them, right? So this is the model that is mostly ranked as something that people want because they, the way that they describe it for themselves is we have a shared part and we have our own individual spaces too. One of the things that I see in these couples is a lot of negotiations, a lot of boundary setting, a lot of boundary crossing because uh-huh. this is space between becomes the space that you put anything else like the in-laws and children and pets uh-huh. and um, any arguments. And there's a lo- it's very common for them to have arguments around chores and the conversation around fairness is a lot in these couples, the contemporary couples. Submergent couples are, if you can imagine, two circles uh, submerged into one another. So that that was what I experienced at the beginning of our relationship. Your diagram almost looks like an eclipse with like a moon over top of the sun or something. Exactly. Beautifully described. Yes. So in that situation, there's not much left of you and your multiple identities. And these are the people Mm -hmm. who um, feel either suffocated or smothered, or I personally experienced it as panic attack in my relationship like 20 years ago, because I felt... um, and I didn't know it was because of that, that I'm mm-hmm. actually losing all of me into the other person. So that's submerged couples. And that's the model that we were brought up as the ideal model, that you become one with the other person, mm-hmm. right? Submerged. The other one I- that I call leftover. Can I, can I stop you for just very quickly ask you this question? Please. Do you think that that is, uh, do you think that that model is like recalls the model that we get from the book of Genesis, which is literally the idea that a man meets his wife, the two, you know, are united and then two become one. Is that, do you think that's rooted theologically or do you think that's just sociologically built into us? I mean, is it both? Is it, is it just like we didn't have any better ideas because ancient poetry said this or how do you, how do you imagine that that's the one that we kind of came to understand as the most common? Sure. Thank you for that. So based on, the literature that I reviewed, uh, theological, yes, as well as the Greek mythology. The Greek mythology huh. and specific to um, uh, the publications of Symposium. So if, if you really go back, you will see that they're talking about um, how humans suppo- uh, humans used to be, well, in, in mythology, humans supposed to be uh, these two-headed creatures with, you know, well, basically connected to one another And then when the gods decided that they are too strong, they split them in half so that they are more defeatable. And for the rest of our lives, our mission is to find our other half. So there are many mythological um, stories that I actually mentioned in the book that come uh, with our beliefs that we never kind of looked back to or questioned. Yeah. Okay. So that. Okay. Okay. Thank you um, for that question. So the next one is the leftover yep. couples. Leftover couples, if you imagine that they are two circles and then something hanging on the bottom, meaning that you live your lives, either you're very self-centered and motivated, individualistically motivated, and then whatever that is left of your resources, energy, time, money, and attention, you pour into the relationship, right? Or you are so um, distracted by the demands of law, uh, life. You see that a lot in immigrant families, for example, that you uh, know, or or people who are of the lower social location or lower socioeconomical status 
that they are so distracted and um, spread thin with everything that's going on in life that um, really there's not much left to give to that relational space. So that's one leftover. The other one is if you imagine that two circles that are encapsulated with a larger oval um, shape. So basically the relationship is, is encapsulating the couple. In those couples, I call them constitutionally bound couples, meaning that okay. no matter what, we will stick it out together. We will stay uh. together. You see that a lot in religious communities that no matter what, the marriage stays or some people who have specific commitments around finance, finances, social, again, you know, as I mentioned, religious couples. Um, so, so relationship comes first and that's how they would like it to be. And that's yeah. absolutely fine for them because the goal is to keep the relationship together, right? The other one is getting where you fit in couples. This get one- Get in where you fit in. Where you fit in, right. Get in where you fit in, yeah, okay. Yes. So in that scenario, if you like imagine this bigger circle and then a circle is trying to um, intrude into the other circle, basically mm. one person lives their life, has their own agenda and life and you know everything that they're doing. And they just tell the other person, you have to fit in to my thing. So for example, if I'm going to move to this place, you have to move in with me. If I'm yeah. going to travel for work, you have to quit your work and move with me. And traditionally, it unfortunately is still in majority of the parts of the world, that's the role of a woman in a heterosexual relationship. Mm -hmm. Or in a same-sex couple dems, uh, what happens is the couple with a lower socioeconomic or social location, usually they follow the other person. So that, that happens too. By the way, as we are going through these, I don't want people to feel like there is a judgment. There's a way to have mm -hmm. that emergent love and all people involved mm -hmm. with thriving, which is the emergent that we get to last. Mm -hmm. But I also want you, as you're listening to us, to really think about there's no right or wrong if it works for you and your couple them. That's, that's fine too. It's just a matter of knowing where you're going and where you're committed to go together um, and make sure that it works for all parties involved. Uh -huh. The second to last is parent and child relationship. This one is when you see somebody who is of much higher status. It could be much older. It could be a uh, much higher social location and social status, economically uh -huh. more stable, um, socially with more status. And then uh -huh. the other person uh, goes in with the hope that they are almost mentored, uh. being guided by the other person. And you will even see that, you know, I, I see that in my couples, that uh, the nicknames that they use for each other even. Uh -huh. It's very interesting that, you know, um, the, the nicknames even represent how they view uh -huh. each other. Again, uh -huh. going back to the importance of names. Uh -huh. um, so that's that. In these couples, as they... Okay, wait, Sonan, two things. One, uh, when you say nicknames, do you have an example? Like, what would be an example of what you're trying to describe? Like, for example, imagine that one person calls the other person baby poo. Okay. And then um, the the other person, you know, the, the person who is in the role of a child calls the other person uh, big daddy. Big daddy, okay. What about this... The, I hear about the parent child dynamic a lot when with couples where ADHD is part of the equation, like there's sort of this, um, but is that's different than what you're describing? Right. Or is it, is that still that G model or that parent child relationship that, that as you're reflecting it, because you know, the, 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 the partner who doesn't have ADHD is like, Oh, I have to tell them to do everything. I have to tell them to do that. And I have to get them to do this and they never forget. And so they feel, and then that infantilizes, infantilizes the, the diagnosed partner is that is that in the same category in terms of, or is that somewhere else in, in terms of what you're describing? That's a great point that you're bringing up. So I have to say, depending on the phase of the relationship, initially okay. a person with ADHD might come across as actually very exciting. They can do mm. a lot of things. They're very exciting. You get attracted mm. to them because of that sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yep, You're just, yep. oh, you know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, but then they, they have all these great ideas. Usually they are very animated. Usually they're very mm-hmm. engaging. But then as you try to build something with them, you realize that the trust issue is broken because mm. elements of trust are consistency and reliability. And with ADHD, yeah. it's very difficult to show up for them and the presence that you bring to the table in any in interaction. One of the things that happen is for the partner of, these individuals um, with the diagnosis of ADHD, they are going to acquire a role of a parent. So it's not mm-hmm. necessarily the dynamic, the given dynamic. They acquire yeah, okay. it over time, right? So yeah, it's that's not their vision for the relationship. It's kind of what happened as the relationship formed itself. Got it. Exactly. So the level of dissatisfaction for them could be actually lower than the first category that I described because they know that you know this is what they're Got signing it. up. Uh, now, parent child, the last but not least is the emergent love model that in this situation, you know, you have it, you know, you are in it when you feel like in a constant interaction of this, you know, the six ingredients, you have peace of mind, clarity of mind, peace of heart. The content of your thoughts are not negative about yourself, the other person or the space between or the relationship. Uh, you feel a level of being seen. Into me, I see, I evolve, and I get mm-hmm. in touch with myself, what I'm proud of, what I'm not, and um, I choose which part of me to bring, and they're all welcomed and celebrated by the other person, and on the other way around as well. Into me, you see, right? So into mm-hmm. me, I see, and then I offer it to you. Into me, you see. You come, and then in this constant interaction of getting to relearn and learn each other, the ball rolls and continues to build and build. Mm-hmm. The fire grows, right? Mm-hmm. By the you way, said that's- last but not least, but but what you mean is last and actually best in terms of the vision that you are proposing. Is that right? Yes, for couples who want to build a lifetime of thriving love and relationship. Okay. Again, no judgment. Some people just want hot sex for one night. Good for you. I just yeah. want people to know that there is no normal. This is just mm. out of our research for couples who would like to build a lifetime of thriving love. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, like I said, I'm obsessed. I think this is the coolest book I've read in a very long time. I'm, I hope that people will embrace it and learn uh, all about what you're trying to do. You mentioned briefly that there's uh, the relationship panoramic. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Uh, sure. So there is a multi-layered uh, product of the research that came out. One of them was, um, as a person who sits with with couples, I want to know what even they don't know. And I'm not Mm -hmm. a psychic, right? And I'm only as good as my observations and the data that the couple shares with me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I found that on the six, seven session, they say something that is actually at the core of what the couple is suffering from. Um, So we try to create a validated inventory so that by validation, meaning we measure what we say we measure and also anybody who takes it get the same, you know, like similar results. So the mm-hmm. accuracy of it is there as well. And also the reliability of it. Um, so basically we came up with this uh, inventory. Again, we meaning that, you know, with Dr. Pejman Azarmina, we came up with this psycho, with a psychometric specialist. We put all of the results of the study into this validation study to see how we can measure the existence of these six ingredients in a couple. Mm -hmm. So that when you get the report, which is about 28 pages, and it's easy to read because it's a diagram, and Mm -hmm. you can see partner A, B, and if people are in uh, uh, blended relationships or open relationships, one of the things they can do is to take it one couple of them at a time because it's right. dually assessed, right? Uh-huh. And then when they receive it, they will see what are the areas that they are very strong at, what are the areas that are almost shaping cracks. So more like a preventative work, but it's not a diagnostic uh-huh. tool. It's like one yeah. of those a tests that you take outside of the, you know, like uh, other things that yeah. kind of predict how you show up. Uh, in a situation. And then they can choose to receive the report themselves if all parties consent, or they can send it to a provider so that they receive it and then they make their appointment with whoever that's qualified 
and then they can um, sit with them to facilitate the conversation for them. They also get the chance to see where they stand as an average of a, um, in comparison to an average uh, couple that we studied that self-identified as being in a thriving relationship. Right on. Cool. And how would people find that? So if they go to the um, to the website of, well, actually, they can go to www.lovebydesignbook.com. Under Perfect. the resources, they will find a lot of goodies, worksheets, and you know, relationship panoramic, everything is listed there. And if they want to find you, they go to? Uh, I have a website under my name, just just Google Sarah Nasser Zadeh. And also on Instagram, I have a very active page and a lovely community. So you they can, yeah. uh, but if you want to receive the resources, definitely sign up for my newsletters on the website, yeah. wherever you find me, because yeah. if they go out and I actually give you some actual tools beyond Instagram daily posts. It's true. It's true. It's true. And uh, the book came out on Tuesday. Uh, I think people should pick it up yesterday. I think you should buy it right now and read it um, or have it as a resource, whether you're a couple person or a clinician. Um, it's very, very valuable. And I'm going to tell everybody about it and become an evangelist. Don't worry. But I want to know what you're doing this weekend. What are you, what are you doing? You're going to, you're going to go like sit in the sun somewhere. Or what, what's your plan? Uh, going hiking. Okay. Yeah. So we are going take to it hike. all in. Yeah. I, I also find that I don't know how is it for you, but I feel like it's very important for me to induce this, this sense of awe in myself. So, you know, uh, just to place myself in this world, where do I belong? You know, there's a whole world and I'm just a teeny tiny part of it. And also remind myself how passionate I am to create world peace, one relationship at a time. I need right. reminders for myself when I'm in nature, walking, thinking. Right on. So we'll leave it there. We're going to land this plane and I will cut you loose and you can go lean into your weekend. Congratulations on the book. And I look forward to uh, following your career and being in touch and, and learning more about how to make love more apparent and uh, available to couples in the world. Thank you so much, Zach. Thank you for having me. Okay, gang. There you go. Sara Nasrzada and her book, Love by Design. I think you should check it out. I think clinicians should check it out. If you're interested again in the panoramic, I'm happy to facilitate that with you. You can email me directly at Zach at ZachBriddle.com. Uh, and we can talk about how that might work. Again, I hope you'll do the daily work of putting more love in the world, but I'll thank you now for the time and attention you've put into making your relationship better today than it was yesterday. Mm-hmm.